Non-Serving Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and I am here with, for the third time in our illustrious history, first time with me as host, um, Michael Swan Laffer, and he uh, he worked in mathematics and high energy physics until he decided to use his background in science to tackle problems of global health and human rights. Um, he continues to work to make it possible for people to manufacture their own medications and medical devices at home by p- creating public access to tools, ideas, and information. And we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about some of um, some big stuff that his Four Thieves Vinegar Collective is up to lately, because there's always something, I imagine. Um, welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thank you so much. Good to be here again. Always nice chatting with y'all. Yeah, I was um, getting sort of psyched to talk to you just by listening to the first chat you did with us. I'm not sure how long ago, um, because it's so annoyingly relevant right now and throughout all of human history to, you know, autonomy and things like that. Um, can you give Can you give our listeners, like, I'm going to tell them to go listen to the um, previous talks you did with us, but give, can you give us sort of the, I don't know, the elevator pitch or the summary uh, of what you guys are doing over there? Sure. In general, the Fourth East Vinegar Collective, we're an anarchist collective, and we work on trying to get medicines and medical technologies to people who have them, sorry, who need them, but don't have them. And we're fairly agnostic as to methodologies of how we get them. And mostly what we do is we try to figure out tools and technologies that people can do to make medical technologies themselves or make medicines themselves so that they can no longer be dependent on sclerotic infrastructure that has many barriers between what you might need for your health and yourself. Um, When you go into a DIY realm, you manage to cut out a lot of intermediate steps in a lot of ways. The main barriers to access to medicines and medical technologies tend to be price legality and lack of infrastructure so price being an obvious one that is usually a result of abuse of intellectual property law Um, then legality is another bizarre one where things are not approved or are criminalized because they don't play well in the marketplace or there's some bizarre ideological battle that's happening because of something. Um, And the third is that sometimes things are approved and they're legal, but they're just not manufactured or imported to the country in which you happen to live. And so again, you have to resort to some of their methodology to be able to try and acquire it. And when you do that, um, when you pursue that, it's often very difficult. And DIY methodologies of trying to manufacture your own medicines or your own medical technologies, they make all of those barriers a little bit moot. If it doesn't happen to be available in the marketplace, if it doesn't happen to be legal in where you live, or it doesn't happen to be affordable where you live, if you're making it yourself, those problems tend to be circumvented by merely taking it into your own hands. So that's our main thrust. Taking it to your own hands is good, though intimidating even for people like me, especially with when you're talking about medicine. Um, yeah. I want to ask you. Go ahead. Uh, I was say we can get back to some of the um, upsettingly topical, the Roe versus Wade shit. You know, we all know, mm. listeners know. Um, but there's some stuff you wanted to talk about, some of the projects specifically. So, um, I guess. Honestly, where you want to start, you know what we talked about talking about, and then I can kind of guide you along there. Sure. So it was interesting. We kind of went into a less public sort of gear when the plague hit. Uh, We tried doing a couple of virtual conferences, but of course, they're they're really dissatisfying, right? You don't Mm -hmm. have the connection with real people. There isn't the interactivity with a live audience that makes these sorts of things so real. And so we sort of decided to 
take our own advice and commit guerrilla warfare in all cases. So you use your weaknesses as strengths. And we said, okay, well, if we're not going to be able to have our usual modus of interfacing with the public for a while, let's utilize this time to try to stage for when eventually we will be able to. Let's try and get more of our projects further along. Let's try to develop them so that they are hopefully in a more advanced stage of development so that they are more worthy for release. Let's try to document them better. Again, this is one of the things that I think lots of projects and certainly we have struggled with in the past that if you, you manage to do something, but you don't document it terribly well, then you have sort of what one of our collective members calls the free piano versus free beer problem, right? Where if, you know, somebody advertises that there's a free piano, like, yes, it's technically a free piano, but it's not really a free piano because you have to come get it and you need to know how to move it and you need to have a truck that you can do that with and you need to know how to tune it once you get it into your house because you're going to have totally thrown it out. And, mm -hmm. and you're probably in the end not going to go pick up this allegedly free piano. It's not really a free piano. And so in a similar sense, right, if you manage to show that a certain drug is manufacturable in a DIY setting that you did it, that's, that's cool. But if you haven't gone through and done the documentation to sh really walk an end user through it, then all you're really doing is kind of a proof of concept and saying, well, if you wanted to go through all of the same difficulties that we went through, then you also could do what we did. Right. Um, whilst if instead you manage to document everything really thoroughly and you have a good walkthrough where you say, here's what has to happen next. Here's why it has to happen this way. Here are things to look out for. And here's how to check to make sure you did that step correctly. Then you're more in this free beer category where everybody can really participate because you have brought it to a point where you, you have disassembled the structure sufficiently so that people can see the component parts, how they work together and why each are necessary. And, and you've really brought it to uh, the public and, and you see this. So this is one of the things we've been really uh, trying to focus on with a, a, a lot of our projects. And wonderfully, we have a lot of them that we're ready to announce. And it's, it's very, very exciting. So we are gearing up to speak at the 2600 conference, Hope, uh, in New York on July 22nd. And we're going to be announcing a whole bunch of projects. And so, yeah, as you and I discussed, there are... What, uh, do they stand, what does Hope stand for? Hope is Hackers people. on Planet Earth. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the conference that the 2600 Hacker Quarterly has been putting on every other year starting in 1994. It rings and, a big bell for me, but I'm not. Yeah, your ilk. <laughs> it's it's a really wonderful conference. It's not it's not gigantic the way DEF CON mm -hmm. or um, the Chaos Communication Congress in Europe is. It's not one of these gigantic sprawling things. It's it's much homier. Um, it's got much more of a supportive vibe the plurality of people there tend to be leftist anarchists, you know, uh, autonomy, body positive, you know, um, queer and trans rights activists. This is sort of the vibe that you get when you hang out at these sorts of places. Um, specifically, occasionally you get people who are there for other reasons, but the majority of people who come to hope are, pretty cool people and so it's it's one place where four thieves has always enjoyed announcing things mm -hmm. because it's a supportive audience that already understands the political rhetoric um in fact the very first talk that four thieves ever gave in public was at hope in 2016 and so it's it's always really exciting to be able to come back to hope and show sort of what's happened in the in the last half dozen years um 
so that feels really good. Yeah. And what has happened? I mean, <laughs> oh, so much, so much. So one thing that uh, I'm going to be so excited to announce and um, demonstrate on the stage is we have an open source DIY uh, automatic external defibrillator. These mm -hmm. are the defibrillators are the magic things that you see in the movies where somebody says clear, an electric shock goes through somebody's heart, and then they wake up. And unlike most depictions of emergency medicine in film and television, this one is actually more accurate. Um, when, if, if you have an out of hospital cardiac arrest, there are two conditions in which, uh, which are considered shockable. This is ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And this is basically when the sort of electrical timekeeping mechanism of your heart gets a little confused and it's, it's off track. And so when you run the shock through the chest, across the heart, and then back, it just stops the heart for a second. And what happens is that can give the heart a chance to just restart. And what's super, super magical is that in the case that somebody is in what's called VTAC or VFib, and you do get uh, an AED, the automatic external defibrillator on them. And this, again, the magic of this is it requires no training. Like sometimes you see them on walls. This is AED and you can just open it. A little alarm will go off. You carry this thing over, you peel these pads off and you put them in these two places on somebody's chest and it does everything for you. This is the real magical part of it. That's the automated part. It mm -hmm. goes through and it analyzes your heart rhythm and determines whether it has a shockable rhythm or not. And in the event that it does, it tells you to stand clear mm -hmm. so that you do not get electrocuted along with like the, the movies person. and like TV. the movies. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so there's actually a recording that will say delivering shock, stand clear. Mm -hmm. And then it'll run a shock through the person and if they are in VTAC or VFib, most of the time that will do it. It'll restart their heart and the person will literally wake up and say, why I'm on the floor. Which I, I, as a total lay person, would not really buy in fictional portrayals. And I know that, for example, CPR, at least back in the day, was like it, its success is overstated in fiction. And I'm getting the sense that this is not really the case with defibrillators. Right. And that's really amazing, right? So if you think about CPR, right? CPR never wakes somebody up, mm. right? The magic of CPR is that it keeps somebody alive. Mm -hmm. You you give somebody CPR, it means that if you've done that between the time that their event happens and when your EMT paramedics show up, they might live mm -hmm. and they might not have brain damage. If you don't do that, they will die but they could live if you do do CPR, but they're not going to wake up. Mm -hmm. The AED is one of these cases where somebody will actually wake up. And the determining factor is how much time passes between when they have their event and when you apply the electrodes to their body and it starts doing its analysis. And this is one of these things where it's like, if you catch it in the first six, seven, maybe even eight minutes, somebody will just wake up and they won't have brain damage and they won't have, they won't be dead. And if it's more like nine, 10, 12, 15 minutes, it's too late. And so if those few minutes are super critical, then the question is, well, how far away is the nearest AED? Right. And this is one of the reasons why it's like, okay, well, is this on every floor in my building or is it on every other floor? And I need to know where it is. Is this near my, you know, the place where I have lunch and the really critical one is like a fire extinguisher. Do you have one in your house? I was just going to compare this to, yeah. Ask if that was like a valid comparison as to the, the ideal sort of situation. Right. You know, and it's one of those things where you see people who, 
consider themselves very well prepared for emergencies and, you know, the sorts of people who have, I don't know, firearms and, you know, a full tank of gas and extra gas cans and stores of food. And then you say, where's your fire extinguisher? Right. <laughs> and so in a similar way, you might ask, well, where's your defibrillator? Mm-hmm. And the answer is most people don't have a defibrillator. Lots of people have fire extinguishers, or at least they have fire alarms and carbon monoxide alarms, but most people don't have an AED. Now, the first reason why most people don't have an AED is they don't know how powerful of a tool it is. But the second reason really? that most people don't have an AED is lots of them don't have like a handful of thousand dollar bills burning a hole in their pocket that they can just spend on something that they expect that they'll never have to use. Right. And that is a big problem. And so to look at something that ranges between three and $6,000, even for the cheap ones, um, it's not surprising that people don't (laughs) spend such a huge amount of money on something that they are basically going to tuck in a cabinet and in all likelihood never use. So despite the fact that it is such a amazing tool, when you think about the risk versus consequence analysis that happens in people's heads, right? It's very unlikely that they'll actually use it. However, if they don't have it when it's needful, it's incredibly catastrophic So trying to bridge this gap, we were thinking about this problem actually as far back as I think 2015 was the first time this idea came up in Four Thieves. But making a DIY AED is not super trivial. Like there's there's a lot going on. It's a it's a complicated system. And with a system like that, you need to work very, very hard to make sure it's really robust, right? You need to make sure that it will stay functional in a dormant state for a mm-hmm. very, very long time, like y- years, like better part of a decade at least. You want to have a very robust system so that you know that after staying dormant for years, when you press that on button, it wakes right up and it's ready to go instantly. And you need to make sure that it can differentiate between a shockable rhythm and a non-shockable rhythm and that it will deliver the shock when needed and not deliver the shock when not needed. And that it has that wonderful voice prompt system that will talk you through CPR if need be, that will tell you to call emergency services, and so on and so on. So we looked at that and said, well, we'd really like to do that, and it would be really nice to develop a DIY version that would bring the price down, but this is not a simple system, and this is this mm-hmm. is hard. So we kind of shelved it, and then a few years ago, we got a couple of biomedical engineers on board, and this question came up again, and we were lucky enough to find this incredibly sophisticated group in Italy who had built an open medical hardware platform specifically designed for medical device deployment in sub-Saharan Africa. And as a pilot test for that program, a guy wrote, a, a biomedical engineer wrote his master's thesis on an open source design for an automatic external defibrillator. And he went through and spent, you know, however many years solving all of these problems that we had been talking about that were so non-trivial. And, and he did just a tremendous job. Um, So great. He goes through and this, the system that he built is so robust that if you wanted to actually get it certified as something that you could sell, under FDA regulations or under EU regulations, it checks all the boxes. So you could. That's a little surprising. And, you know, because of bureaucracy, not because of his um, and your competence. Right. The man was incredibly sophisticated. And this became part of, again, part of his master's thesis. And I believe right now he is, he's now founded a business where they are manufacturing AEDs utilizing this design for sale at a discounted price, specifically geared again towards sub-Saharan Africa. 
I'm not sure quite how far along they are, but we gave them a call and we said, Hey, we'd like to partner with you guys. We think it's amazing what you've done. Um, and we think it's amazing that nobody's heard of it. Um, would you guys like to work with us? And they said, well, you know, we're very busy. We're academics. We have jobs. And I said, no, 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 no. Uh, we just want sort of an informal partnership. We want your blessing. There's a whole lot that we need to work on because this is a two-year-old project. A lot of the parts have obsolesced. We're going to need to redesign a few things. There's a lot of uh, very academic biomedical specificity that's in the current documentation that's not necessary for our audience. And there's a whole lot of detail in how you would assemble this sort of thing that's missing um, that we're going to have to put into our documentation. So we just, we just want your blessing and, and we'd like to show it to you when we're done and, and maybe chat about it from time to time. And they said, Oh yeah, sure. Of course. And I said, okay, great. And, you know, it, it has taken quite some time to reconstruct everything that they did because some of their ideas were a little abstract. Um, the sorts of things that an electrical engineer, it's sort of obvious how you would build something, but the specifics and details aren't there. And again, there were a couple of parts that weren't manufactured anymore and these sorts of details. But we managed to put it together. Um is really exciting that we got it and it works. Uh, I remember the first time I put the pads on and I could actually see my heartbeat on an oscilloscope that we had hooked up to the machine. It was really, really exciting. And you know, seeing this capacitor charge up to 1800 volts is really exciting. It's, you know, and it's dangerous when you're, yeah. if, if you didn't have all these safety mechanisms in place. So it's very exhilarating to think this is a life-saving device mm -hmm. that, we literally have built from off the shelf parts. Um, so at hope I'll have one of them with me and we'll be showing it off and we'll be releasing um, all the plans with the documentation. We're hoping to have a kit space link so that people can merely click and it'll take you to all of the vendors of all of the parts and fill your cart with everything you need and you just click buy, buy, buy. And essentially a kit will show up on your oh, doorstep. Awesome. Yeah. And instead of spending $6,000, you can spend $600 and make it be a weekend putting it together. And you can have a defibrillator that again, hopefully you'll never use, but it can, it can safely sit in your cabinet so that if uncle Chuck slumps over at Thanksgiving table, that you can do something besides just wait while emergency services is on their way. And if it was one of these events, then maybe Uncle Chuck will just wake up and say, why am I on the floor? Mm -hmm. So we're very, very excited about that one. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing to think about what it could potentially do because of the number of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests that happen and that they typically occur at home um yeah you usually sitting over a meal and being able to think that just being able to close that gap of time between when somebody has an event and when the pads hit them that we might have a way to save people who otherwise wouldn't live i mean that's really cool i'm i'm i guess I'm, like I'm stuck on, even in my own head, the, the limitations that I see. Like, would I be able to put such a thing together? Or people's general, probably, fear. I mean, they're, they're going to go through life um, hoping it'll never happen and they won't need it. Um, but the, the, you know, the self-actualized, actually having that ready and having it cheaper. It's, I'm an anarchist, but that's still, like, I don't know. I don't, I'm not active enough for, like to really, I don't know. It's cool though. <laughs> it's so well, cool. well say, say a little more there. I'm, I'm sort of curious what you're, what you're thinking. I mean, I've been, you know, subjected to doctors for like sort of moderate, but ex like, you know, but lingering medical things. And I do have, it's not like I think they're always right or anything, but I do have this feeling like they, you know, learned a lot of science and math. I didn't. And what I, I, I can take fish oil, you know, for my, uh, my joint things and like my surgeries right. and my carpal tunnel, but like right. taking, you know, a heart, like 
anticipating the possibility of the event, buying it, building it um, successfully. And if someone you love is in distress, actually, instead of waiting for the professionals because you're terrified and, 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 you know, sort of frozen, like actually doing it and actually taking the risk to do something as opposed to wait for the experts. There's just like a lot of barriers, you know, even in my mind about that, even though I love it, of course. Yeah. I, and this is something that we talk about a lot in Four Thieves is this question of where, where do those internal barriers lie and why? Mm-hmm. And there, there are all of these, I mean, sociologically fascinating, but very sad uh, internal barriers that are typically built to kind of scare people into inaction in that way. It's it's a big thing, and and it's it's a it's a very typical first reaction when people hear about things like the micro lab where you chemically synthesize your own drugs, and somebody says, "Well, isn't that dangerous? What if you got it wrong? How do you know?" And it's always this thing for me where I kind of have this quizzical look on my face and I said how do you know the pills that you got from the pharmacy are the right thing like <laughs> you're not system. allowed you're not allowed to jump the counter and go check to make sure they got it from the right bin Yeah, you're trusting that you don't get to go behind the counter and see if they stored it correctly you, you don't get to go back and see if when it was shipped it was shipped under safe circumstances or if it sat in a transit center in louisiana where it was 105 degrees and horribly humid for days and days and days and wasn't sealed properly maybe this is all totally inactive furthermore you don't even get to know where it was manufactured or by whom Mm -hmm. maybe there was a mistake in the machine and this is all buffer and those accidents happen all the time and you have no way of checking And again, people who are sort of like infrastructural apologists will often say, oh, well, there's the FDA checking that. And I say, the FDA gets to kind of spot check that. But do you know how many people they have working over the entire United States? It's not like they have eyes on everything that's going on. And these accidents happen all the time. And sure, like most of the time it works most of the time. And that's great because it should but it still strikes me as strange when people are more comfortable with that than they are with a system that they have complete and total surveillance on from start to finish because they did it all themselves. Wouldn't you trust yourself more than you would trust a series of strangers who don't know you and are not emotionally invested in your well being? I mean, call me crazy, but this is the feeling that I get. And that's, that's my perspective. I mean, one would think one would hope, but also there are a lot of things set up to teach people to not strive for that kind of autonomy and self trust. And it's not even like a, not even all of them are sinister. Some of them are more sinister than others, but it's just, yeah, it's not the way it's set up for us. And it takes someone like you to probably remind us that that, that that system isn't, you know, I mean, it's it's failing right now, thanks to the Supreme Court. That's yeah, it is. And in. yeah, I think that's a really great example, right? Because it's really tragic that it takes such a catastrophic failure before people start thinking, well, maybe I could just do it myself. How hard could it be? And I, I'm glad it happens at all. But it's it's sad that we, as you know, humans and Westerners are so conditioned to trust in institutions that we hesitate to act so, so much. We hesitate to act so much. Um, So speaking of the so-called Supreme Court and what (laughs) they did to kind of undermine some of the most basic human rights that have ever existed... Uh, currently, will be 
releasing a project surrounding that as well. And so I'll just give a little teaser that we we have or we will be talking about our particular abortion project on a couple of other podcasts, including Coffee with Comrades and um, Margaret Killjoy's podcast. And so we'll talk about that in a little more detail over there. And again, we'll also be releasing this at Hope. But as a teaser, we will be releasing a another methodology for manufacturing your own abortion pills. We already have a video out on how you can make your own. Uh, making tablets is a little tricky, but if you make them one at a time and um, it's, it's not that hard. If you're trying to make a bunch, it's a little trickier. And again, like they're still tablets, so they're fragile and hard to send through the mail. So we found a new, a new little trick that, um, is well established in the literature, but has never made it into the marketplace and will make access to abortion much, much easier. And hopefully we can all just take a look at the Supreme Court and quote the Big Lebowski and say, well, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a lot about that. I know, um, I don't know if you want to talk about some of your other upcoming stuff. I know the um, the AD was kind of the big, the big thing, but... Uh, Sure. Yeah. Uh, we'd also talked about discussing gut microbiome stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'll give a little more detail on this. This is, this is sort of an interesting one. We as humans all have a number of neurotransmitters that kick around in our brain and the one of the key things in terms of maintaining neurochemical health is having sufficient amounts of each of these things being manufactured. And GABA is a key one that a lot of people in the West seem to be deficient in. And until recently, it wasn't super clear why. But GABA kind of fine-tunes the brain. If you're GABA deficient, you're going to be more predisposed to depression. You're going to be more predisposed to anxiety. You're going to have more difficulty sleeping, typically. You're going to not digest as easily. There are a whole bunch of things that it does. And so I'm... I'm sure you and most of your listenership has heard the the things that have been sort of a, a titter in the uh, popular science sort of news sphere about the gut-brain axis. Mm -hmm. And GABA, the GABA deficiency uh, seems to be tied to these mechanisms. When the human body produces GABA, it has to use a number of chemical precursors, and those need to be present or the body's not going to be able to produce it. And one of these key precursors is called butyrate. Butyrate is strange and different than a lot of other chemical precursors for neurotransmitters, specifically because it's not something you get through diet. And it's not something that the human body can produce chemically. We don't have a metabolic pathway for it. So the only way that you get it is as a secondary metabolite coming from the metabolism of microorganisms that live in your gut, specifically your lower digestive system. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole class of bacteria called butyrate producers. And the interesting thing is when you look carefully, you'll see that Western diets often starve those out. And the solution for rebuilding it is pretty simple. You can take some probiotics, which are just stacks of these butyrate producing bacteria. And then you take what are now called prebiotics, which is food for that bacteria. Um, oh. 
I got the all, probiotics, but I don't have the others in my fridge right now. Yeah, so so prebiotics, uh, especially for these type of bacteria, um, you know, sometimes you hear dietitians or gastroenterologists talk about insoluble fiber mm-hmm. being very different than like fiber in general, right? You, you don't just want Metamucil because that's just going to send your you know, your digestive system into kind of overdrive and you'll just right. like have, have guts drain out. You want what's called insoluble fiber, which is fiber that doesn't break down in your upper digestive system. So it's still in its fiber state when it hits your lower digestive system, which is where the butyrate producers actually live. This doesn't show up a lot in the Western diet. Um, there are a few sources of it and you can get it and you can get it in supplements and there are other ways that you can get it dietarily if you're very conscious about it but again it's very simple you just say oh well i'm missing these bacteria let's take some of them so that they're there and let's both before during and after continue to dose with these prebiotics so that in the lower digestive system these bacteria still have food and the wonderful thing about it is that it's one of these things where you know typically when you talk to sort of dietitian types who want to rebuild your gut microbiome. It's like this very complicated thing where you've got to take stool samples and then you send them off to have the DNA sequence and see like which strains of which bacteria are actually living in your guts and which aren't and how are you deficient. And, and as satisfying as diagnosis like that can be, <laughs> you don't need all of that high technology because you don't really need the diagnosis. You can skip a step and you merely say, well, maybe I'm deficient. Maybe I'm not. I can just take this. And this is very strange for me. Uh, This particular project, the materials and tools, there are no barriers to accessing it. And there's no law that you're violating, which is very weird because usually we talk about things that are very much in the gray area. And this isn't. This is literally like there are two or three things that you can order off of your favorite service or from your favorite health food store, you take them in a certain order over a certain amount of time. And like after a month, either you're going to sleep better and be less depressed and less anxious and digest better, or maybe nothing will happen. But unlike something that's as heavy handed as, you know, maybe an antibiotic or some heavy pharmaceutical, it's not like you're weighing off target effects there are no off target effects. It'll either work or won't. And so for very cheap with no barrier to entry, you can get some prebiotics and probiotics. You take them in a certain order and maybe you'll be less depressed, less anxious, sleep better and digest better. And maybe not. But if those are things that you struggle with, this might be the culprit and investing a few weeks worth of taking a few pills every day, like, it's what's what's not to love, right? I mean, I'm, you're selling me right now. I uh, <laughs> was waiting for you to mention something I don't suffer from. You know, <laughs> um, I guess I, I don't even know enough to like. I've seen mainstream publications and mainstreamy like science things talk about uh, fecal transplants being like a really big deal. I mean, but. I, I mean, they talk about that in terms of, of, of having a, maybe a more substantial disease as opposed to a set of things. I don't know. Is that, I mean, that yeah. seems related. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're very similar, <laughs> right? The, the thing about those transplants that's so strong is that what you're doing is you're taking essentially an entire microbiome or like the seed of an entire microbiome from somebody who has conditions that you already understand and you're just moving it in and provide it again because like you can do that and have it fail if again you just starve it to death right but if you are vigilant about how you do it and again usually it it takes a few steps it's it's a it's a it's a I wouldn't call it a violent process, but it's involved, right? You basically need to take some fairly strong, fairly large spectrum antibiotics, again, that are strong enough that they'll make them to your lower digestive system. And then once they make it to your lower digestive system, they sort of suppress the microbiome entirely. And once you've got 
not a lot of bacteria living in that area. And then you in, put in a bunch of bacteria food and then a whole bunch of bacteria and you wait patiently, then sometimes you can rebuild that. And the, the strength of that that's really interesting is, again, getting away from this huge amount of hubris that we as humans understand microbiome ecosystems well enough to rebuild them from scratch, but instead just say, there's one that works. It doesn't really matter what's in it. We know that this person has a very healthy lower gut microbiome, so we're just going to take from that and we're just going to put it in here. And when you do that, then if, again, you're vigilant and careful about it, it can grow really, really well. And this is one of these like, oh, the fountain of youth, you know, magic. I, I mean, it kind of is. If the thing that you're suffering from as age related is that you've been spending decades abusing your body by e eating nutrient poor foods and like, you know, the, it's hard not to do um, in a lot of places if you're if you're in the U.S. if you're in the U.K. or um, you know Australia, there you really have to seek out foods that are good for your body. Most of the things that are available are very unhealthy, um, and you know, and we all fall into it, right? It's a survival thing. Oftentimes, we eat things that we know aren't the best for us, but they support us in the short run because they do give us the energy we need and they're satisfying and, you know, stress spikes glucocorticoids in the body. And if you take in a large dose of carbs, that helps your body break those down. Is that good in the long run? No, but that's going to help you today, which is probably the help you need right now. And, and so not to go on a gigantic sociological rant, but the root of the problem really is in people having been forced into extremely stressful lives that are hard to escape. And so these sorts of survival mechanisms are the only thing that is really available to them. And taking those small steps to try and make today a little easier that makes sense. That's a robust mechanism, you know? And so I think it's important that there not be victim blaming being like, Oh, you've been treating your body so badly. And it's like, no, nobody wanted to do that. People do that to survive over a short term because otherwise they wouldn't survive. And yes, it has unfortunate circumstances or unfortunate consequences, I should say, because of the unfortunate circumstances. And, and so let's think about how to try and undo some of that damage. Let's see if we can reset the set point in the human body back to something that's a little healthier and a little more natural. And... And the real magic of things like inulin and other non-soluble fibers is that when you when I say starving the lower gut microbiome, it's not it's not that you're poisoning it. It's not that all the junk food has things that are toxic to that bacteria per se. I mean, there may be some, but the real thing is, is that you're starving them to death. So all you need to do is supplement your bad diet with just like one thing that's a little better. <laughs> And then you can keep those bacteria alive. Um, and the real magic, because some people will say, well, why don't you just take butyrate supplements? Well, I mean, okay, you can. I, I believe they are available. But then you're constantly dosing with this thing. When instead, mm -hmm. what you can do is just build a butyrate factory in your body. You know, uh, I think somebody I was talking to said, it's, you can, you know, feed a bacterium and you'll have GABA for today, but teach a gut to produce and you'll have GABA forever. And so it's much better if you can the just, saying goes. yeah, right. You can restructure your body to endogenously produce the things that it needs. And 
the idea that that's not so hard is just amazing to me. It's so empowering to say, yeah, no, you don't have to go out and buy supplements every day. You don't need to be yeah. dealing with these deficiencies that have been forced on you. You can just reset the factory that's really designed to be doing this already. You just need to help it a little bit and you can, you know, be as healthy as the idle rich. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, uh, we talked about talking about some of the off-label use of medications that you guys do over at Four Thieves, and that's obviously a concept that I think everyone's familiar with, because it's a thing, you know, in the reputable prescription system and stuff, it actually happens, but like, what does it mean to you guys to do off-label stuff? Right, well, one of the things that I talk about in terms of the structure of Four Thieves that I think is uh, important to emphasize is that we're not like a research and development group. We don't do original research. We don't invent things. We're basically looking to hijack existing technologies and use them more effectively and make them more accessible. And one of the places where this can manifest very effectively is if you look at a drug that's FDA approved. Now, not to say that the FDA approval process is good or, or thorough, thorough or sufficient, but in you know that it's gone through some scrutiny if you have an FDA approved drug, that at least it has had some people look at it. And so you can at least look at what those studies were and make a determination for yourself as to whether you think this is a safe or smart drug that you should take for whatever's ailing you. Um, and one of the cool things is that if you look into the literature carefully, oftentimes you can find that a given drug was very effective when it was tested for something. But when you look at FDA approval, this is an economic and political process. A drug gets approved for one application, right? This drug is good for this thing. So if it's good for something else, drug companies often won't apply again because it's so hard and so expensive to go through that process. They will apply for the thing for which they think they can market it most effectively. One example of this that continues to just make me spit blood because I'm so upset about it is that there was a drug that was originally a heart medication that was designed as a vasodilator. And it turned out it was this incredibly effective at alleviating menstrual cramps. Now, for anybody who has ever had menstrual cramps or watched somebody who was really suffering from menstrual cramps, if there were anything that were even remotely effective at alleviating that, like you'd reach for it, right? Like it's so painful just to watch somebody go through that pain as like as far as actually experiencing it. I can't even imagine. And strangely, this drug got FDA approval and is one of the most popular drugs in the world, but instead it got marketed for erectile dysfunction, and that is your old friend Viagra. And okay, so the heart thing I had heard with that, um, mm -hmm. and that's like... Huh. So that pivot that occurred, <laughs> they you know, that board sat down and said, looks like it's, this is good for two other things that we weren't thinking about. Which one do you think is going to make us a bunch of money? <laughs> the, the, the one that perpetuates institutionalized misogyny or fights it. And they all kind of scratched their heads for a second and went, huh? Well, here we go. And it's not terribly surprising that that's what they came up with, but it's terribly disappointing. Um, and there's so I mean, many stories of this sort of thing. Yeah, go ahead. I suppose that's, you know, a valid medical application, obviously. It just feels like the least, I don't know. Yeah. yeah but this is the funny thing, right? It's like when you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, okay, so sure, it's a valid medical application. It, it works the way it's designed for what it does. And sure, that's all well and good and cool. Um, 
but the the thing is is like as you know most people have heard the story that it was a heart medication and didn't work especially good as a heart medication but worked very well for this other thing the strange part is very few people have heard about the other thing for which it worked so very very well um I mean, we know that's not a priority for any establishment things. That's pretty clear. Right, which is really heartbreaking. And so there are, there are more and more of these things. There is a there is an FDA-approved drug that can is totally inaccessible in the United States because it is designed for a disease that's considered something that rich people and white people don't get, and so you can't get it. But is really effective at eliminating certain types of long COVID. Um, that's another one that we're really excited to release and we'll be talking about. There are just innumerable drugs that are on the market that do great things for certain cross sections of people. And they're just not talked about and they're not they're neglected and that information isn't out there. And so despite the fact that you might still have to go out of your way to get something because it's, not typically accessible having the information that it can be effective for something else is is quite quite powerful so we will be announcing some of these at hope and we'll be doing a talk at defcon at the biohacking village specifically addressing this question of utilizing drugs in off-label capacities that can work very well um, we'll also be doing a workshop at the DEF CON Biohacking Village where people can come by and, and see the open access AED and actually like take it apart and put it back together so they can see cool. what would be required in order to build their own. Some of the other medical devices that we're releasing so that people can see all the bits and pieces and, and actually get their hands on them and play with them and, and learn about how the structure works. So that's all very exciting. And That's I encourage cool. everybody to come by. I I know for sure that Hope is also attendable virtually. And that's not just like you can stream the talks, but there's some system that they're trying to set up for live interaction so that even if you're not in the room, you'll be able to ask questions and, and, and interact with the speakers. So you can get a virtual ticket for Hope. And of course, the talk itself will post publicly uh I don't know, usually a week or two after hope happens. And, and a few weeks later at DEF CON, I believe DEF CON is hybridized this year. So you should be able to stream uh, if you're not able to attend. So we encourage everybody to come on by uh, either in person or virtually. Yeah. DEF CON, I've thought someday I'd love to do a press thing there, but again, that's sort of above my pay grade in terms of knowledge for now. Um, well, it's a fun event all the same. Yeah. It's a good party. I mean, I've watched war games multiple times. I could become an expert. Hey, that's a good start. I, I watched war games. <laughs> I know the origin of the name, damn it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> good start. Um, well, this is a wonderful combination of like being like you, you, you make me angry and like inspired to listen to um and on that note uh i guess so so vice maybe isn't like the new york times but uh i saw for example a vice thing about making your own abortion pills um Mm -hmm. and i was we were talking about how reproductive health is maybe since it's the most politicized it almost inspires more people to be more autonomous about it i think is my sudden theory i've decided in the last 10 minutes i think that's part of it because there's such a direct pushback on something so personal that people react but i mean it's rational but i I think that that's a a a surface factor for sure Mm -hmm. uh my personal view is when you look at human rights as a whole system that the fundamental underlying thing that needs to be addressed before everything else you get a priori is health rights because if you don't have your health you don't have the capacity to participate in 
any of the other rights that you might or might not be afforded. So health rights have to come first in human rights or the rest of the discussion is moot. And then when you bring the microscope in an extra click, then you see reproductive rights as being the vanguard of health rights. Because again, this is one of these things that allows you or disallows you from participating in the rest of it. And it cuts both ways. Either if you are a firm believer, believer if you're a firm believer in the systems of heredity and that you want to create progeny and family, and this is where your notion of autonomy and stability comes from, mm -hmm. or alternatively, you're on the other end of the spectrum, if you're an antinatalist and you believe that that is the system that's going to be the best for you personally and or for humanity as a whole, or anywhere in between that, if merely it's a matter of timing where you say, in order to build family responsibly, you want to do this under very specific conditions, if those choices are not accessible to you, then you can kind of say goodbye to the rest. Yeah. I mean, I also don't think it's a coincidence that, say, mainstream Democrats sometimes sound the most anarchist when talking about the principle of abortion rights. I mean, suddenly they're purely about autonomy and choice and stuff, and they never sound that way otherwise. Um, it's interesting the way things fall into sharper focus when when the stakes go up, right? And this is one of these things that's really interesting, and it's one of the places where I think disability activists are some of the more sophisticated people working in the health sphere because so often when you bring up a health rights issue, if it's not something that's life-threatening, you're going to be dismissed. Like, yeah, yeah but, you, you know, sort of like, yeah, but did you die sort of attitude. And it's like, have you ever had a cold that, like, put you out for the day? Right. Do you remember how, how that felt, that you were totally ineffectual for the day? Imagine that were every day. Yeah. Where is your compassion? And and it's so weird to say, okay, it didn't deprive you of your life. But again, in a similar way to what we were just talking about, it deprives you of the capacity to participate in any of the things that make life meaningful. Mm -hmm. And some people argue that that's worse, even. And and I, I think some of those arguments are quite strong, and mm -hmm. so to have that dismissed by people who are working in the political sphere, I think really makes their short-sightedness fall into relatively high contrast. And sometimes, like you say, we'll do the opposite, where you will bring up these things that, that are so harsh when you're talking about things that actually kill people or things that actually strip people of so much autonomy that it's not something you can turn a blind eye to that suddenly their systems of rhetoric become more consistent and more all encompassing. And suddenly you look at somebody who's kind of a hardline Democrat and you're like, Hmm, you kind of sound like you're a little closer to those of us who really think things through what <laughs> happened last night. And, and again, like the, the thing that, comes to mind is again it's like this is it's so stark it's so clear and present it's so in your face and it is so irrevocable that in the same way that if you're going to die that's not something that you can like reverse and then deal with later that's that's a one-way right. thing and similarly if you pull a life into the world that's not something you can put on the shelf and deal with later that's that's again irrevocable try. yeah right well you know, we can get into child abuse another day but <laughs> we can um, but 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 given that that is the root of that as you point out you know that's that's all the more reason of why it is so critical to put tools in people's hands so that they can have the capacity to control things so that the trajectory of their lives and the trajectory of subsequent lives can be made as good as possible because you know ultimately 
what is the goal of really anything that we do except to increase the quality of life of people? That is, that is the goal of health. That is the goal of politics or should be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about yeah. that. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's the goal of my politics. How about that? No, yeah, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I, I won't speak for anybody else, but <laughs> like, that's why I do what I do. Is this the, the hope is to make it so that since we're all already stuck here, let's try and make it a little less hard. And so let's um, let's get together and, and try and sh- try and make it a little bit better. Do you see any? jump from what I'm to, to generalize like a, a lot of right wing, but definitely not all right wing uh, reaction to, to, to COVID. A lot of the rhetoric about that was very, my body, my choice. <laughs> has anybody jumped? Do you think and has sort of gotten a greater understanding of the whole deal that that principle actually extends to say reproductive rights or, you know, trans rights or other things like that, obviously. I mean, oh, I wish anything- <laughs> I've, I've not seen right now. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've not seen any evidence of that. And, and as hopeful as that might be, again, there's this, there's this bizarre disconnect that happens in a lot of that rhetoric because it is so goal oriented and not principle oriented sure. that's it's both its strength and its weakness is similar to the way that when you look at the logic on the other side it is so married to the concept of underlying principle and ethics that that can also be a greatest strength and also a very clear weakness so when you see rhetoric on the right talking about those sorts of things sometimes you get results that are counterintuitive they're what you would not expect but are still very potentially positive one example of this was uh in the pre-trump era there were 37 red states in which there was a pretty strong right to try law on the books that if you were deemed terminally ill that it was kind of ain't nobody's business what you do trying to save your own life which again was rooted in very different rhetoric than the sort of thing that i work from or that a, a lot of people on the left work from but still was a result that i think a lot of us were like well, that's kind of nice. And then during the Trump years, there was a federal version of that law that passed. And I Mm -hmm. was kind of like, that was kind of an unexpected little bonus there amidst the, the, the mess. Mm -hmm. Um, I forgot about that, but you're right. And, and so again, when you see these sorts of things where in that realm, the, the rhetoric comes up posteriori. They have something that they want to get, and then they will build some sort of an argument, typically fairly inconsistent, designed to support that. Oh, God, that's true. Of course that's true, yeah. (laughs) And and if you – and so, again, sometimes you look at the reasons they give, and you're like, well, those are kind of my reasons, or the opposite, oftentimes – you know, as an anarchist, you will run into a libertarian and they'll want a lot of the same things you want, but for very opposite reasons. And it takes a while before you realize their motivations and you're kind of have this, this terrible cognitive dissonance where you're super horrified about why they want what you want. <laughs> and it's very hard to try and figure out whether this person is a potential ally or really, really somebody to, to try to assiduously avoid working with. Um, and similarly, if you look again, sort of as a, as a photo negative, you find that on the left, people typically are motivated by a very strong set of underlying principles and they work very hard to logically extrapolate to say, if these are the principles that I hold true, what does that imply for the way that I should work politically, the way that I should live my life, the way that I should teach, uh, and so on. And again, this is all a greatest strength and also a greatest weakness because when you have strong, consistent moral principles, it gives you 
a very good sort of rhetorical skeleton, but it also limits your flexibility, right? Unlike the other end of the political spectrum where they'll justify anything to try and get what they want, when you're trying to actualize something, oftentimes it can really bog things down when you are so careful as to not act unless you've analyzed everything very, very logically and you make sure that everything is perfectly logically consistent and that anybody with whom you're in coalition with has perfectly matching values. So not that I'm saying that that's the wrong thing to do. Um, I feel like morally it, it's it's very defensible, right? That is sort of what we should strive for is to say we understand why we're doing what we're doing and we understand the chain of logic that gets there. But again, it can make things more difficult. Um, so, so to circle back to your original question about the rhetoric that got espoused from the people who were anti-mask and anti-vaccination, the idea that that would generalize utilizing a logical framework to think like uh, you know autonomous trans rights uh, autonomous choice in terms of reproductive rights i mean you know, what's the name of the old beach boys song wouldn't it be nice um yes, but i, I really don't see it happening again because yeah. of the structure of wanting end results versus having supporting rhetoric the that that rhetoric was grabbed out of convenience, not because they were trying to utilize any system that was logically consistent or going to be supportive. But, you know, I'd like to think that there were one or two people who like kind of raised their eyebrow and said, well, do I really believe this? And what else should I believe? And, oh, interesting. But uh, it, I think the majority probably were not quite that erudite. I mean, I was never pro-life, but I was, I started off oddly wishy-washy and I was trying to like chart what happens. And at the end of the day, it's only about like, it's your, your, your body and that nobody else can decide for you. It doesn't make sense that anyone except the woman or the person in, you know, is going to, is going to decide it. That's, all. but if you haven't come to that, if you haven't gotten to that, I don't know how to, you know, get you to that, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, people talk about competing um, interests, you know, people who are a little more moderate sounding, but there's still, how can anybody else say, I mean, decide? It's, it's, uh, it's absurd, but. Well, and one of the things that I think in terms of the political landscape of abortion in the United States is that people often mistake it as a two-sided issue. It's not. It's a three-sided issue where okay. on one side you have people who would like human rights and bodily autonomy. Cool. That's certainly well established. And then on the other side, or what people see as the other side, you have people who, for reasons that are grounded in what they see as a moral structure, see abortion as something that's fundamentally wrong. Right. But it doesn't stop there. The thing is, is that there's a third group that sees the second group as very highly motivated, uh, very well funded, and very easy to manipulate as a voter base. Uh, and those people really are totally, totally neutral about the topic itself. They just are pragmatists who are looking for power and see that one of these groups is very well organized, extremely militant, very well funded, and will be a very consistent and strong voter base. And when you look at m meteoric careers in American politics on the right, oftentimes you will see politicians who started out on the right somewhat moderate, typically being pro-choice, mm -hmm. and as they got high enough in the ranks, they said, oh, well, if I have the evangelical vote, then I can make the next jump in my political career, and they switch. And you see this with Reagan when he went from governor to president. 
You see this with Schwarzenegger when he became governor. Mm-hmm. Um, and the list is really, really long, but it's, it's very, very classic that you see these moderate Republicans that were doing very well. And they were about to take the next step in their political career to get to a higher echelon. And they needed a guarantee of a wider voter base. And they said, Ooh, got to grab this one. And they did. And, um, I don't want to ask you to tell me what security things you're doing, but if you go to your website, you know, I see a warrant canary. I see some other stuff on the, on the video about the equivalent of a warrant canary. I don't even know how to articulate, but, um, are you kind of thinking in terms of increasing security and 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 carefulness at all, or were you just already already at the level of, you know? Well, we work pretty hard to be pretty careful. The thing yeah. that that we really are most concerned with is that people who are utilizing what we're utilizing are safe from prosecution, mm-hmm. and so that's why we have a a hidden service, an onion site on tour so that people can go to our website and nobody has to know that you came and looked at our stuff. Um, we have wrestled a lot with takedowns, which is why we typically don't post stuff on YouTube anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, we will typically post stuff on our own website or mostly on the internet archive or on some of the sort of federated, um, distributed, uh, visual, channels uh, like uh, I think bread tube was one of them a few others of those like peer tube structure things. Okay. Um, and with one of our projects we've set up a specific hidden service just for people to exchange information and materials um, we'll be debuting that also at defcon at sky talks so if you actually make it to defcon um, Sky Talks is something that you should come see because we've got a really good big surprise for everybody. Uh, hope to see you there. <laughs> I mean, I almost feel like people like you have been preparing for this, even though Democrats have been sort of waiting, you know, fearfully for, for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. People like you have been really substantially preparing, and I just wonder, you know, I, I, you're not going to, you, you weren't going to win allies and talk about the COVID thing that way with the principle, but I wonder if, you know, if your movement in general is going to grow be, specifically because of this. And I have to think at least partially. Well, I hope so. And I, I, I wish it weren't necessary because right. as, <laughs> as people always say, like, you know, how would you qualify success of four thieves? And I say, well, not existing anymore. Right? We really Absolutely. shouldn't be necessary either a, because the infrastructure works the way it's supposed to, and people are getting the medical attention they need through infrastructure or alternatively by the concept of taking control of your own health being so normalized that it doesn't have to be associated with us, but just people say, instead of, have you gone to a doctor to say, have you done some research about that and when they say research they don't mean like you know googling on webmd but actually reading some scientific papers and learning a little bit about how your body works because you don't have to become a doctor to treat yourself you just need to become a very narrow subject matter expert in your body and you can learn a little bit about what's known about your particular ailment uh, the reason that it takes so long to go to medical school is they got to learn a little bit about everything. And that's very difficult and takes a long time. Sure. Okay. Yeah, well, certainly grant that there's a reason we consult doctors. It makes sense. However, right. you don't need to be a doctor to take care of yourself most of the time. And it's still worth consulting with what people call subject matter experts in a lot of cases, but also in the plurality of cases, it's not entirely necessary. And maybe it's only necessary for a short part of the journey. And the key being that along the way, that is a choice instead of a necessity to say, sure. oh, my body is this black box and I'm scared and I won't think about it or learn anything or make any decisions myself. I'll just go to this expert and blindly put my hands, myself in the hands of some stranger and hope that they make good decisions. 
and maybe that'll work or maybe that won't, instead of saying, well, I'm going to go chat with an expert and we're going to talk and I'm going to learn some things and I'm going to make some decisions based on what they say and based on what I think and evaluating the situation. Um, and so many people are still scared of that because of the way the narrative has been built in terms of fault finding. When something goes wrong, typically people ask the question, whose fault is it? If somebody gets sick and dies, if it happened within the medical infrastructure, it's, isn't that too bad? Like it's nobody's fault. It's just, it didn't work. It wasn't enough. Not that, oh, who screwed up and why did that person not live through this process? It's, oh, that's too bad. It's nobody's fault because it's infrastructurally supported. Well, on the flip side, in, in, the, in our time, if you take your health into your own hands and you're making autonomous decisions and things go wrong, they say, oh, that person was reckless and didn't follow doctor's orders. Right, right. And yeah. it's so it's strange true. that like in this point in humanity, the excuse, the the offloading of responsibility to say I was only following orders is understood as totally insufficient in a war crime. And yet, and yet, and yet in health, it's totally the opposite where you are supposed to take the medical officer's orders and follow them unquestioningly, or you are the reckless one. While instead, when you look at the moral issue in a war situation, you are supposed to be, as a soldier, examining the chain of command for moral lapse. Why are these things so disparate in the mind of the public? It baffles me, except for the fact that we didn't have a World War II with health, except we totally have. <laughs> if you listen to Anthony DeFranco from the Open Insulin Project, he makes this incredible observation that just looking at access to insulin, there are more people dying regularly at, at a rate that's higher than we're dying at the height of the Second World War in just the soldiery. How can that just be okay? and people don't examine it morally, we're still stuck. Somehow, somehow it's been pushed into the darkness because it's, well, that, that won't happen to me. I'm fine. I, I continue to be baffled, and I'm not entirely sure of the structure of this. I have many more questions than I have answers. And... I'm glad that there are some people who are trying to unravel it. One of the best books that I have read in a very, very, very long time by Jesse Singer is called There Are No Accidents. And she's one of the first people to sort of look at how the perception of when something goes wrong has been geared to trying to assign blame rather than looking at the structure of the system and saying what is wrong with this structure on the whole that made this accident possible or likely and instead saying whose fault is it who's going to pay and so i think that that is just an incredible first step that society and humanity can take to become a little more sophisticated in terms of how we think about how we deal with conditions being safe, be they for roads or hospitals or generalized health or eating habits or any number of other things. And once it becomes commonly obvious for the necessity of people to examine and be invested in their own health, I think that a lot of things will get a lot better. And that is the shred of hope that I cling to. And we're hoping to push that along just a little bit. 
That's good, because I was about to make you give me a, a scrap of optimism just to end on, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to stand it. Um, well, there you go. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> is there anything outside of Four Thieves and medical and healthcare developments? Is there anything else that's exciting to you that you're not actually actively involved in? Well, we don't work directly with the Open Insulin Project, but I think that they're doing just incredible work. And they are really in it for the long haul because it's going to be a while before they are able to release anything and they continue to just work tirelessly. And it is an amazingly difficult problem. Um, in terms of queries that we at Four Thieves get, probably number three is insulin. Typically mm -hmm. people are talking about uh, HRT and then they're mm -hmm. talking about reproductive stuff. And the third thing is always insulin. And I say, insulin is a very complex, difficult problem. They're really smart, sophisticated people working on this. Please go talk to open insulin. They're great. Um, that's super exciting. Um, I think that there are a number of gentler uh, quieter movements that are happening within the medical industry that are getting better. One of these is trying to avoid pick line infections. Okay. So if you get a pick line infection, it's very unlikely that you'll live through that. I, I don't, I don't even know how many documented cases there are of people recovering from pick line infections. It kind of just doesn't happen. Didn't know that. And it's entirely avoidable. And it's seen by hospitals as just like, well, why have male practice insurance unless you male practice every so often kind of attitude. Um, and there's one hospital that I believe is in the Pacific Northwest, notably run only by nurses, where they had no pick line infections. And somebody said, well, what are they doing differently? Well, what they were doing differently is very simple. They had a pick line team where pick lines were not to be installed, utilized, or maintained by anybody who was not on this team. And that team had the responsibility of installing, utilizing, and maintaining pick lines, and they did nothing else. Okay. And they trained very hard. There was a six-month training program that was only about how you handle pick lines. And every six months, they would re-up their certification for this, and those, they had one job and one focus, and they never had a pick line infection. Now, why doesn't everybody do this? Well, because you need a team of employees who only do one thing, the only benefit of which is that you don't get people dying of pick line infections. And so if it's worth it to you to spend a little more money so that people don't die, then you should be doing that. The problem is, is that hospitals are companies hospitals are businesses in the united states which again continues to confound me terribly it makes so little sense um and so if you're looking at somebody who says this is a business i'm trying to optimize well then that's a waste of money people die and that's unfortunate and if that's an acceptable loss via somebody's reckoning then you can just let that go but again these examples of people who are sufficiently forward thinking that they're saying, yeah, this costs a little more, but we decided that human life is worth something. So we should do it. And guess what? We're going to make you look bad by saving more lives and show that it's possible. And by contrast, people will start to notice that what you're doing is negligent. You don't want to be the, um, the doctor discovering hand washing and people looking back and saying, God, why didn't everyone else adapt that? You right. Know? Same sort of thing. So, so yeah, I'm hopeful that as you know, humanity continues to have more history and, and have more context that we can grow and, and learn more and take better care of each other. All right. Well, um, Michael, it's been really awesome to talk to you. I'm going to tell people. Thanks so much. If they, Want to follow us um, here at Nonservium? On Twitter, it's Nonservium Media, all one word. 
If you want to, you can follow me on Twitter, which is Lucy Stag, all one word. Um, tell the people where to find you and give them a call, another call to action if you like. Yeah, so um, I'm on Twitter as well. I'm Michael S. Laufer, and uh, Four Thieves also has a Twitter account, although it's not very active. I mean, following me is probably better, but we're, we're trying to get that other thing up and rolling. Um, fourthievesvinegar.org is our website um, that we're currently trying to overhaul, but it's up. It's active. You can see some of the stuff that we've done in the past. And call to action, as you say, I would say if you, um, if you like what Four Thieves is doing and you'd like to support the cause, uh, go out, find somebody who needs your help, and help them, even if you think they don't deserve it. Keep each other healthy, keep each other safe. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I like it, I love it. Thanks, Michael. We'll have you on again, I'm sure. You're listening to the Non Serbian Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform? You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.